Uh, I want to thank uh, the Center of Excellence, uh, all of the Centers of Excellence that have been represented here today in bringing you this program. Uh, and I also want to recognize uh, the departure of a great leader at Centralia College, Jim Walton. Jim, you really be missed. You've contributed so much to our work, so thank you for that. Yeah, give my hand. I also want to point out that I, I have the, uh, the luxury in a way of just planting seeds and people pick up on them and make them go. So the planning committee for this event were really the people who made this event happen. Uh, it's one thing to spew out ideas over coffee or wine and a few people to pick up on them, pick up on them and say, hey, that would be really interesting for a summit. So while it might have been an idea I had, I'm sure I wasn't the originator. I probably picked it up someplace else, maybe from one of you. But it's great to see an idea uh, bloom and, uh, and grow. And uh, I hope that you'll find this day to be very interesting, fulfilling, and also very useful. Um, so, um, I also want to give a big shout out to uh, Joram Bauman for his talk this morning. Everybody, what did you think? Well, Uh, I guess my only disappointment is we didn't hear more of his own predictions because I don't know about the rest of you, but I find, I find little more entertainment in, in an economist that gives projections. <laughs> so uh, next time, add some more forecasts, Joram, and we can all be more entertained as we look to the future. <clears throat> and speaking of the future, I think that it's important to recognize that some of the information that Joram presented this morning uh, can be treated as somewhat sobering if you really dig underneath the surface. And I think it's all uh, true that change is happening right now. The evidence is pretty overwhelming. Uh, I remember reading the first intergovernment uh, panel on climate change report uh, back before the end of, of last year. I don't know if any of you had a chance to weed through all of that without falling asleep. It was uh, pretty wonky. But it was also very sobering when you look at some of the forecasts and projections for what we have in face, we're going to be facing going forward. And following on the heels of that was the U.S. National Climate uh, Assessment. And I, I just want to read the opening paragraph to that report, because for me it really sums up kind of where we are. It goes, climate change, once considered an issue for a distant future, has moved firmly into the present. For me, that really sums up where we are, the challenges we have to face, but also some of the opportunities we can carry with us going forward. And it's interesting to me, uh, maybe I'm just too deep into the data, that there are still really lots of mixed beliefs and a range of opinions about where things are. On the one hand, uh, you have the deniers. You have people who, for whatever reason, for either personal beliefs or they have a different perspective on evidence, uh, believe that we don't really have a problem. And their, their antidote is, let's just get on with business as usual. Let's just reinvigorate that economy and grow, grow, grow. Let's, let's move on this, and what's the problem anyway? Now, on the far extreme, you also have people who are reading all this data, and maybe they're getting a little depressed, because it seems pretty overwhelming that we've got some big challenges in front of us. Um, so those folks are the folks who are maybe feeling a little hopeless, and what can I do? I'm just an individual. But I think there's also, a, certainly in Washington State, with the work that's happening here, a belief that we're entering in a phase of what many people call the great turning. Really, this is where people are taking action. They're coming up with fresh ideas, technologies, points of view, policies that are going to take us into a new future that's based on a sustainability uh, mindset, a sustainable future for Washington, for our nation, and for the world. That's a much more hopeful future, I think all of you will agree, that we need to pursue. And I think that's part of what we want to talk about today. Washington is truly a national and global leader on that forefront. We're a national leader in public and private sector policy, uh, in actions, in strategies. The governor's executive order is another good example of how we want to take that to the next level. And we're a state and a region in which we're planning for action. Certainly, we're going to be adapting to the changing conditions we know we're going to face. But we're also trying to figure out ways to turn back the dial on greenhouse gas emissions uh, for the long term and for the long term healing of our planet. This is also a time of opportunity. And I think a lot of people forget this. Uh, you heard Yoram mention this. We have technologies that we can create 
uh, that we can offer to the world. We have new products and services. We have more policy, policy synergy than we've ever seen before with more organizations and coordination happening to really take on this problem. And we have a lot more integration at the forefront of our economic, social, and environmental uh, components in our economy and in our, in our region that really are focusing on that idea of a triple bottom line for prosperity going forward. Now, we can't do this in isolation. We all know this. We need more collaboration, more cooperation among all sectors and all partners. Our industry partners, our labor partners, education and government, everybody working together, taking actions that make a difference and helps to unify our efforts and inspire us to leave a legacy of action, not indifference. Who is going to do this work? And this is an underlying theme of this conference as well. Those of you who have come to a summit conferences in the past know this is as much about people as anything. So in addition to the technology solutions, the new work processes and practices that we hear about, a clean and sustainable future is going to depend heavily on developing and nurturing the talents of our workforce at all levels. Because those innovations, those new products, those services, those policies, come from the people that we produce and the skills we equip them with. That's our future and that's an, a really important aspect of this conference. And hopefully you're, to hear, you're here to learn more about that. So with that as a context, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel. I want to point out that my colleague Sally Zeiger Hansen has been passing out some cards. We're going to attempt to take some of your questions during the course of the discussion because really our goal was for them to have a discussion and to and enter in some questions you may have. We will also save some time at the end of our panel as well to answer questions from the audience. So um, I'd like to go ahead and provide brief introductions, but what I've asked is for each of our panelists to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their organization and their role in that, and then to provide some reaction, if you will, some feedback uh, to you about their, what they picked up about Yoram's keynote presentation and perhaps other information they brought along the way that they think is relevant today. So I'm very uh, honored to have uh, the opportunity to moderate this fabulous panel. Uh, and they consist of uh, Stacy Smedley from Skanska USA, Keith Phillips from the Governor's Office, Ron Langrell from Bates Technical College, Larry Brown from the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 751, and David Allen from McKinstry. So welcome to all of you today. I appreciate you coming. I think I'd like to start with Keith, just because I think you've, you're in a good position to think uh, and talk a little bit about the governor's perspective on climate change and the issues that our, our state faces. So Keith, if you could kick it off by just introducing yourself, a um, little bit about the work that you're doing and, and the governor's paying attention to now, and any thoughts you may have in response to Yoram's comments earlier today. Well, good morning. Thank you, Alan. I'm Keith Phillips. I work in the Governor's Policy Office um, on climate and energy. My main role there is to implement the executive order that the Governor put out in April on reducing carbon pollution and leading in the clean energy transition for the state. And that's probably all I need to say about myself because this is more about what the, the Governor, I think, brought to office from 20 years of trying to think about the opportunity that Alan just outlined. And uh, Yoram's wonderful presentation. I, I, I'd like to hear you speak for another half hour or so, so we'll arrange for that. Um, but there's a particular graph that he showed that shows up in the University of Washington report from December, in the United Nations report from March, and in the U.S. report from May that is particularly compelling and telling. When you take all the modeling about where emissions and, and temperatures are going and you roll them all up, you come to two conclusions. The first conclusion is we've loaded up the atmosphere and the ocean enough that it'll be hard to make a difference. There's a climate lag in the system. Things are going to get worse before they get better. But if you look at the reasonable best that we can do and the reasonable worst that we might do in terms of emissions and temperature, you start to see them diverge in the 2040s. You start to think about that, 2040. And the picture that they paint for the latter half of the century is starkly different. The frequency of drought, the inundation of shoreline communities in Washington, the risk to our agricultural crops, our forest fire implications. You sort of start reading down that list and you could get depressed. Uh, but on the flip side of that, the way I like to think of it is we have a choice. 
Uh, if we act now, we actually can prevent the worst that climate change can bring. By the time my kids are retiring, by the time my grandkids are looking at getting their families going. I know I have slow grandkids, sorry. But the choice then isn't, I don't think, uh, characterized the way most people do. We either need to deny the climate or we need to start hoarding for some doomsday scenario. I think the choice is much more subtle and much more sort of in this middle crowd to sort of think about. Do we wait and see? Do we see if the, it does get worse? Do we hesitate? Do we worry about wasted effort and sacrifice? And there's probably some caution and care that needs to go into it. Or do we do what we can to make a difference for our kids and for the future generations and for the state? And Governor Inslee has made that choice. His commitment to the state and his family in particular, there's no one more precious to him than his grandkids. Uh, he believes that Washington needs to do what it normally does. Follow the science, take responsibility, take action, and lead in order to make the difference. And there are some upsides to that which you'll hear about later today. I also want to emphasize that it's not like we haven't been doing anything. I mean, you need to take a look at what we've done and the progress we've made to sort of get a sense of where it's possible. In this state, we buy cleaner cars than most states. We signed on to that early, since 2009. Uh, we are increasingly building new, modern, efficient, and integrated buildings. And you'll hear about that later today. Uh, we also are focused on renovating existing buildings to make sure that they save money and reduce emissions and reduce energy costs. Uh, we are increasingly making our electricity cleaner with renewable sources and capturing all energy conservation. Uh, we have we produce more renewable electricity than any other state in this state, and it's only getting better. We're well along that particular path. We produce and we use our own renewable transportation fuels and are growing a lot of our own opportunities to put in our cars and our trucks. And we have uh, local governments who are national leaders on thinking about how land use and transportation can be done in a way that reduces congestion, reduce, increases the efficiency of which people and goods can move, reducing costs and reducing emissions. So what does that all mean? Back in 2005, we did a forecast because in our uh, sta state law today, we have limits on our greenhouse gases for the state. 2020, 2035, 2050. We haven't figured out how to get there, but we've taken a look at how far we've come. In the last 10 years, with all the state policies and federal policies in place, we are more than halfway to our 2020 limits. We've made a significant amount of progress in bending that curve, and it hasn't broken the bank, and it hasn't caused displacement, and that's an important thing to think about, but at least between the science being compelling and progress showing that it's possible, and if we act now, we have more and better choices. We actually have some opportunities now, as opposed to waiting and acting when it's really desperate and later. Thank you, Keith. Stacy, would you like to go next? Oh, sure, I'll definitely follow Keith, no problem. All right. <laughs> Hi, Barb. <laughs> um, I always like to start. Um, I'll get into Skanska in a minute, but I believed in climate change from the time I was eight. I lived in Clackamas, Oregon, in a very rural rural area, and my grandpa bought, built a house there that we lived in. Um, and so I had this natural playground from the time I was about two that I'd go out and sit under my trees and read books and climb them and pick blackberries and all these things that I thought was normal for all kids. When I was eight, he decided to sell our land. And being eight, I didn't really understand what that meant until I could watch all of my trees get cut down, all my blackberry bushes go away, and be replaced with empty dirt lots and black asphalt pavement. So from the time I was eight, I told my mom I wanted to build buildings and not cut down trees. Um, I'm still trying to do that. And Skanska has given me the opportunity to, to be, I think, the closest I've gotten to eight-year-old me's goal. Um, I had 10 years in architecture. I built some net zero buildings, some living buildings. Um, Skanska was on the leading edge, was the contractor on the first living building certified in the state. That means it's net zero energy, net zero water. Um, and I think Skanska is unique as a contractor. First, because we're an international contractor. We have Sweden kind of dictating what we do. So you know, Sweden and the European um, sector would be over in that far left area somewhere. Um, not spineless, though. I don't know if I agree with left and spineless, maybe because that's where I live in my life, too. I'm not fine. I'm going to have to give Yorm a little talking to later. Um, but <laughs> Mother, Mother Skanska, as we call it, um, coming from Sweden, is, is trying to progress <coughs> the construction industry here in a way that, that isn't um, maybe typical or, or mainstream yet. Um, doing things as a contractor, usually you're responding to a client's need or innovation or to what the marketplace is wanting you to do. So there's, there's some of that that's going to come from some of these carbon taxes and things that happen. But 
being able to lead on the construction side by looking at carbon footprint, um, by in coming up with innovative solutions for clients, and also developing our own projects where we can go as far as we want to go in the construction industry. So I'm proud to work there. Um, we're doing some pretty amazing things with carbon, and I'm interested to talk more about that today. And I'm not spineless, Jerome. I'm over here, but I'm not spineless. He's finally looked up so I can point at him. <laughs> Great. Ron. Uh, I'm Ron Lane Grill, and I'm president of Bates Technical College, and we're a community-based technical college that has locations in downtown Central and South Tacoma. Um, we've also seen, I think, over our 75-year history, a creep, if you will, with uh, Tacoma proper, becoming Pierce County, becoming 800,000 folks. And uh, my institution's an interesting one in that... Uh, Pierce County is essentially 60% uh, white, 40% non-white with equal parts of Hispanic, African American, Asian American, and then Pacific Island or other. Um, but in the zip codes my particular institution <coughs> serves, uh, we're 40% white, 60% non-white. And so when you think about uh, the four acute care hospitals within a thousand yards of our downtown location, um, we sit on the least represented, last unencumbered uh, worker force um, in our county. Those guys that are machinists at Boeing uh, have sent all their kids to University of Washington and we're trying to get people back in the pipeline to become machinists, right? Um, so getting our neighborhoods encumbered with the idea of <coughs> Uh, world-class career technical fields I think is our challenge and it's not just uh, an opportunity it's a mandate not only to stay competitive in uh, Pierce County but stay competitive um, as a state and I think as a country I just make this brief observation about our presenter this morning my theme today is going to be leadership and maybe that got kicked off Alan by your presenter talking about the void that could be created in the absence of uh, Dr. Walton as it relates to centers. Leadership is key. We've done the accountant's audit on this issue. The accountant's audit is we are in desperate trouble. And the trend lines on our trouble are even more disparate. And the accountant's audit hasn't got us the consensus to move forward. And it's sobering because it's so compelling. And you make a compelling, excellent summary. My hope for us today is through leadership, we move to the economic audit. The economic audit goes beyond the accounting of the data. It's where the leader has to come in, draw the line and say, it's incumbent upon us to move forward and move forward now. And like most leadership decisions, President Walton, there is no easy time or way to make that decision. It just takes a mass of folks stepping forward and saying, today is the day. So the economic audit that I heard about um, uh, really gives me hope related to my theme, um, Alan, which is what role does leadership play in this mosaic? Thank you, Ron. Larry Brown. Yes, thank you. Uh, again, uh, it's great to be here amongst such distinguished uh, fellow panelists. Uh, I am the legislative and political director for the Aerospace Machinist District Lodge 751. Uh, primarily, we represent the hourly workers that build uh, the greatest jets uh, in the world. And uh, I started out as a machine parts inspector uh, at the Auburn Fabrication uh, Plant and uh, started going to my union meeting and uh, was really thrilled to find out that they were involved in politics and public policy. So I got involved and uh, that's how I ended up in this job. Uh, as um, I assumed the responsibilities for that, uh, it occurred to me that we had a challenge as working people in America. Uh, with respect to the global economy, uh, the uh, need to compete for jobs uh, in, in our state, in our community, uh, 
uh, that uh, we had some choices to make. Uh, we could either compete based on standards of living, uh, in other words, lowering our standards of living to, uh, to compete with uh, lower paid workers uh, in the third world, uh, or we would compete based on value, productivity, and quality. And so in order, uh, that was our preference. And so uh, we uh, started working towards uh, making contributions in the workforce development uh, and workforce training uh, area. Uh, I served on the board at Green River Community College for a while and now serve on the state board for community and technical colleges. And uh, I'm very uh, appreciative of the work that our uh, colleges do. Uh, they help us uh, maintain that standard of living by bringing uh, leading edge skills and workers to industry. Um, so with respect to climate change, uh, you know, I think that, uh, again, that's an opportunity for working people. I'm glad to be able to be here and be part of this discussion because all too often, quite frankly, uh, well-meaning uh, government, well-meaning uh, uh, industry folks uh, sometimes forget about the people that actually, uh, you know, turn the metal, make the, uh, the parts, build the buildings, and we want to make sure that we're part of the solution. And so uh, we appreciate being here. Great. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> David I Allen. I agree. Well, many of you in here know of my company, McKinstry, for our work in, 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 I guess it's not climate change work, but it's definitely sustainability and energy work. Um, uh, I'm, I've been at McKinstry, I just started my 37th year. Uh, it was started as a plumbing company on Main Street in Bellevue, 1959, by my dad and my godfather, Mac McKinstry. And we've grown a lot, and just before I comment on Yaron's uh, opening, we're, we've grown from that to a 750 million, 2100 person uh, company. Uh, in the last 12 years, 13 years, we've done over $2 billion in work that is considered green, sustainable, or energy related. And we probably have five to 700 people full time, none of whom job existed in 2002. So to your, to your, your one of the things I liked about the presentation, because I'm, I'm not a climate change expert, and, and, and I try not to think too much about it because of the obvious reasons what would happen to you if you thought about it way too much. Um, I, I think that we work, our company works in the space of working with now technology, doing things we should do now, all of which affects the big pictures. And, and I, you know, I'm on the board of Rocky Mountain Institute. And I was the, the, the founding board chair for the Washington Clean Tech Alliance. So I've been, I've been educated by fire from the environmental side and the business side. And you know, and I think you may know uh, Jigger Shaw, who wrote, who wrote this book, Climate Wealth, and was the first executive director for Richard Branson in, in the climate war room. And all of the great, all of the great writings and, and things we're involved with talk about a market-based, business-led solution to this stuff. And, uh, and it hasn't escaped the, the Jay and, and, and Keith and everyone either. But um, there is a huge opportunity. I think some of the things that Yoram said and I like the right and left. I talk to college kids all the time. I say, we do not have a 1%, 99% problem in this country. We have a 15, 70, 15 problem. 15% are way out over there, as you pointed out. 50. And 70% of us are in the middle, willing and able to compromise and come to some agreements. And everyone give a little and everyone pay a little to get to the solutions. But we're held hostage by the extreme so much, it's hard to get anything done. So, uh, as far as what Yoram was talking about, I think he, he, he talked about the business-led, the capital creation, the economic story, the, um, you know, the leadership, you know, uh, people are going to be exposed that come out heavily as an elected official on climate change being in Washington uh, for obvious reasons. And the China issue is going to be a really tough ones that the electeds and the economists are going to have to fight for us because it is, it, it is overwhelming what's happening over there. And it isn't going to get fixed over there without America 
doing something, meaning having R&D, creating jobs, coming up with, with technological solutions and getting it to them, showing leadership that we have to do this because um, it's just, you know, we work, we work in, in 40, 30 states now. And if farther east we go, the, the less buy-in there is on this stuff, as Keith sort of alluded to us being a leader. So um, I have a lot more comments on leading later, but I will say, we probably work in 16 different incremental get better areas, we call them, from geothermal to waste energy to buildings to sustainable design to recycling to uh, biomass boilers. And so McKinstry is sort of, we're, we're technology neutral. And we don't think there's a bad idea to solve this problem. That, that's sort of the, the basis that I'm going to present today on. Great. Thanks very much, David. You know, part of the, the beauty of having these panelists here today and the way that we constructed this summit for your, uh, for your learning today is that we looked at the integration between manufacturing, construction, uh, and energy. There are a lot of commonalities, lots of reasons to think that uh, collaboration is really key. And in our panel, we've got a good mix of those three industry sectors and, and beyond that. Uh, looking forward. And I guess just one general question I want to toss out. And by the way, I want you guys to have a conversation about this. I don't want talking heads. That's not what this is. The reason you're facing each other is so that you can talk to each other. And the audience can benefit from that, from that discussion. So I, I guess one question I think the audience would be interested in is for the organizations and sectors that you represent, wh what adaptations have already been put into place? What future changes do you see needing to happen from your industry sector's point of view uh, to be able to address climate change now and going forward? Anybody? Kick it off. I could uh, go ahead and uh, kick it off because it's probably a little less complicated uh, for us uh, as working people. Uh, we just merely have to adapt and, adapt and adopt the uh, tools and skill sets needed. Uh, so for example, in uh, the 1930s, uh, aerospace workers had to learn to adapt to metalworking instead of cloth and wood. And now we're having to uh, figure out how to work with carbon composites, plastics, and manufacture in that arena. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, making sure that we have uh, a, a skill set uh, that will help us earn a living in the future. By the way, I forgot to comment on Yuram's uh, uh, presentation, and you know I really appreciated it. Uh, but you are the only uh, stand-up uh, economist that I've met. But that stand-up actuary that I saw the other day was not as funny as you. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know that. I think. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, there's you know, those words that have been thrown out there now by everyone up here, leadership, compete with value and quality, education partnership. I think all of those things come into play when it comes to how to position yourself, at least from the construction and, des and design industry, in a place where, when you know these things are coming, what can you do now to be innovative and progressive so you're, you're in the place to respond when they're here? Um, so at, at Skanska, that means looking at things like life cycle costing, the governor is supporting that as well in terms of looking at the benefit or the cost analysis of a product or decision based on a life cycle instead of just what's happening when you construct it. And Skanska has tools they develop to help clients do that. There's carbon footprinting to figure out, you know, how much is it costing us to get the concrete to our site? Where is it coming from? Where do our workers come from for transit? So if there's a carbon tax in place in the future, how can we respond to that and provide innovative ways for them to get to work? How can we pick the concrete that's going to be the less expensive for us when those things come into play? So there's ways to be, to lead, not follow, or respond. And I think that's one of the, the themes for Skanska, at least. Yeah, I think, I think you're being very humble. Skanska actually, development and construction, actually going to deliver next month or soon. Uh, a building that's sort of, in, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, more relevant as a sustainable building than Dennis Hayes' Bullet Foundation, in that they went after it, they went after the, the energy codes, the water codes, all the recycle, all the things that you could do to keep it at market rate and make it economically sound to repeat around without the solar panels. So I think it's 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 not it's not about it's it's also there's you know 
think big, start small, yeah. and do things incrementally so you can show how change can happen and, and over time and over size and scale. And one of the benefits of Skanska is that we started a commercial development group, and it's actually brilliant. It comes from these great minds, you know, from internationally, where we can develop and, and kind of price and fund our own buildings, be the owner, so we can make these decisions, and then construct them and learn the lessons on the buildings as we construct them, and then provide it at market rate for clients to show that it's possible and they can see the benefit in a building like that. So yeah. I appreciate you. Yeah, and that process, that if you step way back, what we're seeing in, in the state, in the cities, and codes, and policies starting to back this up. We need to, we need to get the behavior of citizens, workers, like safety, when we had the safety crisis in the 70s in construction, and we fixed it. It's, it's, we need to get people to have the behavior that it's all about taking waste out of all processes, all transportation, all bad fuel use, whatever it is, if, if as a community, you can look at how you design, how you build, how you get to work, how you operate, what you buy, where it comes from, where it goes. We, will, we need to take that thought to policymakers and have, and I'm, we're relying on you to do the hard stuff, we fight. <laughs> we'll, we'll sit back and get the residual and implement. But it's, it's a, it's a part, I see going forward, your question about going forward, I, I think partnering even with Billy and the avionics, air, the biofuels, all right. that stuff, right. we, we meet with them. We, we're sort of in this partnering. Everyone's in the partner circle. I mean, I wrote down a few things that's going forward that's got to improve. Codes, dashboarding, grids, echo districts, waste energy, policy. We, we, we've got a good state. We're going forward, but there's a lot more to do. What did you say? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely, but we will not be able to do it alone. Right. So we sort of start with the adaptation question of uh, looking out to see if we can make it real to folks. Uh, the drought frequency in the Yakima is growing. Water rationing is going to double by the end of, this, uh, the end of this, this particular decade and go up from there. So people are building water reservoirs to preserve their trees, to preserve their crops, to preserve their way of life. They're trying to figure out how to be more efficient with water, which fits into the, if you can be more efficient, you can reduce emissions, you can reduce costs. Uh, you look at the shoreline designs for our communities. Uh, the governor will be visiting here in a couple weeks the city of Anacortes, who in the middle of construction stopped the work on their, waste, on their water supply plant and figured out it was too low. If they built it now, it was going to be underwater. They were going to have seawater coming into their city supply. So they backed up, started over, rather than do the wrong thing, and they took, because they lifted their eyes and took a look. So that's a real, honest look. Uh, forests. Our forest fires increasing trend, tremendous cost to the states. We broke the bank and then some on firefighting last year. Uh, you can go visit pine beetles. We have a brand new pine beetle that's, invest that's infested the gorge. I've never seen it before. Uh, we have um, shellfish algal blooms that are poisonous to humans showing up two months early. And the number of shellfish cases going to hospitals are starting early, they're growing, and they're lasting longer. So people can go, well, wait a minute, why is that changing? Why is that changing? Why, is, why did we have a five to 800 year flood in the upper, in the upper Chehalis? So you start thinking about those things. Uh, he will be the governor on Friday, visiting with the uh, shellfish industry. They're moving their operations to Hawaii because the water in Puget Sound is too acidic and it melts the oysters when they're growing. They ship oysters. We ship world-class oysters to 36 different countries from this state. It's a major industry. Several thousand people work on it, and we're having trouble growing those things. So you start there, and then you go to who's solving the problem. Every one of those industries is solving the problem. The folks up here are helping solve the problem. And I think the, the new technologies are going to be required in the clean energy transition. That's going to mean new skills will be required from the workforce. Uh, but it'll also create new construction, new services, and new jobs. And so I think we're here to, how do you bring people's awareness around it to the point where they're willing to support the policy so that at the end of the day, the investment can actually strengthen our communities. So get the point about tools, putting those in place. We know what to do. We have policies driving those, those ideas, uh, new innovation, new products, new services. We know we have a need for new skill sets from our people, our talent. What are colleges and universities doing beyond that to help solve this problem? You know, I'm, a, I'm an interloper. I, uh, <laughs> after 17 years in Walla Walla, I took a seven-year sabbatical in the great state of Minnesota. 
So I'm recently back, and I'm, I'm really proud to say that what I've seen is tremendous gain on the shoulder to the boulder, if you will. Um, from an accreditation standpoint, now you find sustainability present in those elements and standards of our region. Um, accreditation is self-regulated. That is us setting a higher expectation for ourselves. I'm looking at data and the measures we now have to monitor how we're doing. And I look at just the difference between that data in 2005 versus uh, where we are today, and I, I, I think we, we have no reason not to act on the data we have, whether it's dashboards and or um, budgets at the end of the year. The third area in terms of facilities, Bates is long overdue with capital. We're, we're in the middle of one project on an advanced technology center, um, getting ready to be in the queue for a health science center. I'm very impressed with the state's investments. The governor actually came on campus and celebrated uh, energy efficiency investments that brought our college five million dollars that will return on that investment literally in months rather than years when you think about it over a five or six year period. So the business of higher education has responded very well. I want to give you a conundrum that educators face on the workforce side because I was a party to building a robotics program in the 80s and the jobs weren't there yet and the program folded. You've got two great examples in this state right now where you have a world-class water management program in Walla Walla, Washington, trying to repopulate or re-moisturize uh, um, the Walla Walla Basin, and for that matter, uh, other parts of the Columbia Basin. And the pipeline of students isn't there. The enrollments aren't there. We've built that bleeding edge program that is gonna help provide industry tremendous advantages, but the bleeding edge nature of it may mean that if we're not real careful, we're almost too far out in front of the challenges we face. The second example is at my own institution where I believe we have um, certainly a regional class biotechnology program. And when you look at that science challenge alongside the allied health professions, it's really hard to get high school graduates to matriculate into those because the priority isn't there as a society yet and the wages aren't there in those demand occupations. So I'm not sure how we're doing. You know, I see an explosion in the green sector training programs and jobs and servicing those jobs, but we've got our challenges, Ellen. I would say, so by night, I have a, a nonprofit that is all about sustainable education in K through 12 and how we educate kids about STEM and education and by using buildings as the tool. And I think we have to start earlier. It has to be something that comes from educational reform where STEM and sustainability become part of the core curriculum where there's hands-on, we were talking about this earlier, vocational learning where there's more, where's shop class go? I mean, I, I took shop class, I became an architecture student, but I used my hands and I still love to build, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that kids love to do and if they were able to celebrate it more in school, I'm gonna ramble a little bit because this is where my passion really is. Um, but I think, you know, starting earlier and having it become intrinsic into what kids are learning and appreciating, when they go to college, they're gonna look for those services and those programs more than they are now where we're, in my mind, siloing them to, to be able to look at paper and take tests. So I think it's an earlier problem than, than, than higher education that we need to focus on too. Yeah, you also have the distinction, I spoke to Huxley College at Western Washington last year, and they're like 80. I said, okay, only five of you get to be advocates when you leave school. Other, other 75 have to go into business and, and government and move the damn needle. And that comes from what you're talking about. We need to inspire young people that these are technical, they take STEM, they take, a, they take entrepreneurship, they take passion, and it's a, good, it's a good career rather than have all the STEM kids want to work for Google and Microsoft and be dweeby. So speaking as one of the uh, few advocates up here, <laughs> Uh, I have to say that um, when I took shock class in the uh, 70s, early 70s, uh, that uh, I remember the conversation was tilting towards this idea of 
you know, we don't want to put kids in these shop classes because we're tracking them to yeah. some predetermined, yeah. what, job? And, um, <laughs> and, and so I'm very happy to see kind of a resurgence. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Gehring at uh, the Manufacturing Industrial Council uh, has been pushing this core plus concept where uh, young people are in the K-12 system are able to get uh, credit for uh, uh, you know, actual um, technical and, and shop class uh, time uh, where they apply the math and, mm -hmm. and the science uh, concepts that relate to uh, technical field. So it's, uh, it's very gratifying to see that change. It's clear that we need a skilled workforce to pull this off. It's also clear that sometimes there is a mismatch between what the market needs and what we can provide and matching up resources. But a common refrain that we hear from many in the private sector and some in the public is that all the additional policy and regulation and so forth is going to make it harder for business to do what it does best, which is to create jobs. Uh, just recently, the Obama administration and the EPA are coming down harder on regulation on, on, on power plants. Um, is it true in Washington, for instance, that these regulations are going to be uh, restricting or limiting job growth going forward? What's your perspective on that? Keith. I'll jump in there. I think uh, the new draft EPA rules as proposed under the Clean Air Act uh, put Washington first in terms of the obligation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from our electrical sector. 70% by 2035. Wow. Uh, states like Montana, 20%. So the governor's first question is, wait a minute, I thought I was the good guy. Why are you asking me to do more? The reason they did this differently state by state is they took a look at the agreement we had to transition the coal plant in Centralia to a cleaner natural gas plant or to an alternative and to provide community support for doing that and make sure we get it done in a smart way. They took a look at what we were doing with our renewable electricity. They took a look at what we were doing with energy efficiency and the good work of folks here. They added it all up and it was pretty close to 70% already on the books going forward. They said, well, give them a couple extra percents of energy efficiency we haven't figured out yet and call it good. So as a result, we're pretty comfortable with 72. Montana's pretty uncomfortable with 20 because they have four or five large coal plants sitting there and a coal-based economy. So the Montana governor calls up the Washington governor and goes, I need help. And we actually buy. When the hydropower on the Columbia drops down, uh, when power gets short, we buy coal power from Montana and use it in the state. So who's responsible for it? EPA says Montana. Well, maybe that's convenient for us. But if we're not responsible for our own emissions, you know, we're just sort of moving the dial around. The same with jobs. If you regulate in a way that simply tells companies, go somewhere else and take your jobs with you, we failed. You've got to do this in a way where you're not only encouraging the clean progressive businesses to continue to expand, giving them the space to innovate, because we're an innovation state, and that's really where our competitiveness and our strengths comes from and the opportunity comes from. But you also have to work with existing industries. Because if they can become more efficient, they can become more productive. If they can become cleaner in their energy sources and in their products, they will be more competitive. And the first person to get to scale with a new technology and bring the cost down is going to win the race. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think I've been following what the, the governor's office has been doing. From a macro sense, I, I, can't, I can't get my arms around the big coal. Uh, I, mean, I had an article here about most of the top 100 sites of, of CO2 are not even any of the Western states have one dot, but um, some of the things, what I think about EPA policy and, and government policy on this stuff is it needs to be very collaborative and very, uh, has, to assess the, has to assess more transparently the externalities of, their, that, of what it might do to the market. But there, on, the, on the flip side, for example, we have an opportunity in this state to create a whole bunch more manufacturing jobs, not with composite wings, but with composite everything. The Rocky Mountain Institute, which I'm on the board of, was early adapter in electric cars as far as R&D, getting it to scale and launching a company, and then it, it, it scaled. They have <laughs> switched that whole priority to light weighting cars because they studied it and they found out that actually people get rid of their cars every five to seven years and that if you could lightweight cars, you could cut two-thirds of the, of the triple the efficiency in 12 years. 
which is, just, is, which is the same thing as saying, I'm using less Petro, right? So there's an example of our state, I think, I think Jay mentioned it too, the carbon uh, facility, the wing facility being here isn't just for wing, it won't be just for wings. There's gonna be carbon used in everything because it's strong and it's lightweight. So, uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I stay out of policy too much because it, it freaks me out and I get all weirded out about it, but I, but I, li I like someone taking responsibility, but I think it's, it, we have a lot of Americans to convince at every turn of the road. And I think you mentioned you can't do it alone. I think it's a partnership with, with labor and businesses and, and designers and builders and technical colleges. We, we have to get on the same page. And I've said this to you before. Years ago, environmentalists, shame on them, they went to Olympia alone. Business, shame on them, they went to Olympia alone. Shouldn't go to Olympia on these issues if you aren't together. Because it just makes it harder for you guys. And, and quite frankly, I think that uh, all too often, those that oppose uh, the idea of, of remediating for climate change have created a false dichotomy, false uh, conflict, saying it's either about jobs or it's about the environment. And uh, so the State Labor Council, for example, is convening a table, the Blue-Green Alliance, uh, so that we can work on issues together. You know, one example that I know that the governor is dealing, and the uh, Department of Ecology is dealing with uh, a surface water quality issue, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that, you know, I think that if we all got our heads together on the idea of dealing with this environmental issue, we would figure out that, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are solutions that, uh, you know, industry wouldn't have to bear the brunt of, of uh, you know, the blame for all of this pollution that we could, in our communities, deal with stormwater runoff. And I know it's a little bit uh, a far field, but we have to look at these, uh, you know, make the investments in our infrastructure that will solve our problems, uh, that will create jobs and, and have better outcomes for our communities. Alan, I wouldn't speak to regulation, but in, in terms of policy, you know, some of the misgivings of doing bleeding edge, hoping you're out there in front of, of industry, have paid great dividends for our state. You know, when you think about the Centers for Excellence, I founded the center in Walla Walla in agriculture. People were scratching their heads saying, why are we doing this? Now I look what the centers have done in terms of enabling us to mobilize in aerospace with uh, the recent investment, 1,000 new workers um, coming at us. We did, it, we did energy systems technology skill standards for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I've had three people here refer to those skill standards. Those were done 12 years ago in the context of our meeting today because the relevance has caught up to some other applications in industry. And the last one I'll give is that robotics analogy. Right now, uh, the failed robotics program funded by GM in Twin Falls, Idaho, because we got out in front of where the jobs were. We're applying some of those standards in our robotics program at Bates for the aerospace industry, down in machining where we're loading those, uh, those decks for um, materials that will be either machined or fabricated. So uh, I think policy in our state where it's proactive, accountable investment have paid great dividends, even though in some cases, a little bit like growing up on the farm, it's delayed gratification. So you have all done a pretty good job of the jujitsu on regulation and state policy. Um, are there areas where we need to do better? I mean, are there opportunities here that we haven't discussed from, especially from private industry's point of view, where state government, local government, could do a better job of supporting growth in these clean energy sectors that we haven't already attached yet? Uh, it's like, yeah, so I think um, there's the relevancy thing, and I think I'm not a big policy person, but uh, um, what I'm learning is that it's all about relevancy and how you make things relevant to more people to get policy passed or changed. And the carbon tax, um, I want to talk a little bit about that, I'm going to bring it up now, um, is something that I think is a progressive next step in some ways to talk and think about. And there's a business leadership group uh, that's forming in Seattle that's got names like Starbucks and Vulcan 
in Skanska, REI, sitting around a table talking about what kind of carbon policy would us as a business group support and advocate for and take and talk, you know, say, Keith, this is what we as the business leadership think is a good idea. And we did a graph very similar to what Yoram proposed where it's the carbon tax and, and the offsets where we could actually benefit. Like construction labor tax went away and the carbon tax was there. That would benefit building, um, but also um, help with the carbon problem. So I think thinking progressively about it, figuring out what as a business group or sector holistically we can support as that next step is important and that's starting to happen. Yeah, and, and the sta our state leads in a lot of things that McKinsey does in other states. I think that, I still think, you know, that one of the, and, and Keith mentioned it already, yeah, that, that there are four numbers I've, set, I've preached, I went back and checked them, they're still pretty much right, is that there are 82 billion square feet of non-residential buildings, existing buildings. It represents about 70% of all electricity consumed in the United States. It represents more than 40% of the carbon. In, in egg. And the guesstimate at 50% of it's wasted and on the table to go get. So, so as far as what needs to be done more, I mean, McKinstry does $300 million of that a year, and we're tiny, I mean, McKinstry's tiny in the, in, the, in the national scene, right? So if we could do $300 million every year of lowering people's energy consumption, we need more policies, because the government leads in that, by the way, the GSA and the DOE and the the counties and the cities and the states, we, we can't get the private, it's hard to get the private sector to buy into deep retrofits and lower their consumption. And I think you're working on that now. And the state has been very, not to pat you on the back, because I'll argue with you on something else, but um, you've done a great job of altering <laughs> delivery of your buildings, the 10, 6, 1083 and the, the WSU campus at Everett are both alternate deliveries that speak to Okay, tell me how much it, what, what does it look like? What, how, what's the program? And how much will it cost me for 20 years? So instead of just building a building and then going, oh God, we, should, we don't operate that very well. And then the real money is in how you, how you operate it. The state's adjusted. And I think that delivery in Skanska development's really leader in all this stuff. We've got to start having the built environment be accountable for its long tail of water, power, uh, productivity, transit-oriented design, location, its partnership with getting people around, and, and uh, that's where we need to go on building. So what about the public sector? Ron, for, for our campuses, our universities to really follow suit, and to try to be more sustainable, that doesn't just happen overnight. You don't do that with, without resources. Is that an issue for colleges and institutions? I think so, and whether it's on the business side <coughs> or the workforce side, I'd compliment Larry and his work on the state board. You're not related to Marty Brown. No. You? Okay. Um, I don't want, I don't want to be sucking up to the wrong people here. But um, <laughs> yeah, he works for me. <laughs> he, he, you're his boss. That's right. um, I think what's been key and what can be a real driver is the ultimate challenge we face in this state, and it's shifting out of an enrollment-based measure of performance to a quality and, um, and deliverable that has to do with um, demand occupation, full-time, year-round, permanent employment, uh, assigned to the sectors in most need. You know, it's, it's a tragedy that we have uh, other interlopers coming in from out of the state who are serving the students of the state of Washington. And, you know, I, I just applaud the efforts to try and shift from an enrollment based, an, an exclusively enrollment based fun, funding mechanism to a performance based mechanism. And I think um, the whole um, sustainability dialogue fits well into a performance um, framework. And so, again, whether we're measuring uh, how many of our students go to work, or the efficiencies of our buildings and the gains on HVAC and uh, emissions, uh, performance is where it's at. And guess what? There are five people up here who, who are going to resist it tooth and nail for our own bureaucracies. And this is the difference between uh, performance viewed by the accountant's audit 
versus where we've got to be and what we've got to do as leaders in the business of, of energy or sustainability. So, Larry, you, you and Ron both and, and, and David have raised some, uh, some sticking points, some challenges that uh, you face as individuals and for your organizations about how we do the best job possible of matching supply and demand, how do we make sure that we don't get into a chicken-egg argument about what comes first, the jobs or the skills. What do the rest of you think are the bigger challenges we have going forward as a state? whether it's about the economy, the environment, or social equity, how we do a better job of supporting uh, and raising old boats in the state of Washington for our citizens. That Keith. was too big of a question. <laughs> yeah. Can you be more specific? I mean, the government's job is to create the policy framework within which businesses and communities can succeed. And we try to do it in a way that sends the signals that the society is ready to accept or that society is, needs to be looking at in order to be able to say, okay, invest here, because this is where we need to go, and the rest of the infrastructure, and that includes the workforce training, the colleges, the research folks, we have to figure out a way to bring them in. Now, the governor keeps um, challenging us. We go in to talk about K through 12 education. He wants to see the climate curriculum, the ocean acidification questions, and what the students at that level are learning about clean energy and energy efficiency and responsibility. And then he goes, and how come they're stuck inside? So that this year he creates an outdoor recreation task force, and he goes, unless the kids have had a chance to get out in a sleeping bag and get muddy with their parents, they won't appreciate what they've got in their environment. So, and the good thing about that is the, the REIs of the world, the ecotourism folks, the folks that are in economic development are going, that's absolutely right. You know, we have a huge industry. When you look at our natural resource, both the beauty side and our utilization in terms of agriculture and forestry, we're missing the boat if we don't have to create that opportunity. And he, that's, so it starts sort of at that beginning level from his perspective. Then he turns to the colleges and goes, how is STEM contributing to the solution? Uh, why aren't the universities investing more in uh, advanced uh, manufacturing? So we are actively competing with a consortium of folks in this state and others to become a center of excellence for the federal government on advanced manufacturing. Uh, he asked for money and got some of it to create the new Clean Energy Institute at the UW, uh, focused on solar and advanced energy storage, because we don't have the tools yet. And then he got funding to have the utilities demonstrate the technology and the new entrepreneurs have the ability to get to market. So we're, we've funded a community bank uh, and one of the things they're doing besides investing in integrated building residential design that is energy efficient and distributed generation capable, he is investing, the bank is investing in uh, uh, digesters that take manure from farms that currently you can digest it and produce electricity. We've got a number of dairy farms that use, turn their poop into power and that kind of thing. But the new 2.0 digesters also produce fuel for the tractor. And that technology is there, it's available, it deals with the waste and fundamental principles. Why do you want to pile that stuff up on the land and the rest of us have to drink it when it leaks? Let's turn it into your farm power, let's turn it into your farm fuel, let's give you that extra edge, that economic edge, and there's an opportunity for success. It's so comprehensive that the question you asked, there's nowhere, there's no place to turn where you don't see it. But what Larry, talk, what we're all talking about is back to there's no bad ideas. We need to get R and D, get kids out there, get smart, thinking. A lot of the breakthroughs of McKinsey have come from people from the Center of Excellence, people from community college, people from our apprenticeship programs. But we, you're going to get see a press release in about two weeks from Amazon, and this is just a bunch of young people from McKinsey poking around the Western building downtown, across the street where Amazon is going to build the four towers. And they said, wow, that's a big, that build, that's the biggest boiler in the city because of all the, all the discharged hot water and heat lost in the atmosphere from data centers, the old building, and they built, we built the second one for them, there's a third coming. So one of our young engineers goes, well, why don't we quantify what we're, what's going down the drain and going out in the air? Maybe we could put a heat exchanger in and maybe we could sell it to somebody. Oh. So we did it, five megawatts. We signed, we, McKinsey is going to build a heat exchanger underneath the street. 
It's going to enough for all the free hot water and all four high rise showers for Amazon out of the drain and out of the air. Cool. Wow. <laughs> young people, mostly young people, smart people, all the crafts working together, crawling around the building. That's the solution. Another significant uh, sector of our economy uh, that we often ignore in Western Washington or underappreciate is marine maintenance and manufacturing. That's another area where carbon uh, application can work. Uh, I, I was started my technical career in the Navy, and I'll tell you what, uh, ocean water does a lot of, of damage to metal, and uh, if we can uh, figure out how to build this fleet of fishing boats out of carbon, uh, I think we can yes. really make some money doing that. Thank you. Can I answer your question so fast? This will be fast. But I think for me, you know, we talk about all the things we still have to do here, but we are in a state that has done a lot, going back to your 70% reduction. Oh my gosh, we've already, you know, gotten there. So my, what worries me is that we're in this bubble. We're in a place where we have all these things, we appreciate them. What's happening outside the bubble? I mean, we can talk about this stuff, but most of us have drank the Kool-Aid to some extent, or have heard the Kool-Aid a lot. <laughs> If you go other places, the Kool-Aid's not even being made yet. So it's, it's how do we take what we're doing here and, and outside the bubble and kind of pop the bubble so it's, it's spread to places inside this country even that aren't popping like we are right now. You know, that kind of ties to one of the questions from our audience as well, and it has to do with who is it that's going to be doing this work. And let me just read this, this question. No disrespect, but most of this panel is made up of older white men. <laughs> I'll include myself in that. What are you or your organization doing to get a younger, more diverse group of people active in and taking a leadership role for issues related to climate change? I'll anyway. start on that one, Alan, by just saying uh, you build an advanced technology <coughs> center with a project labor agreement <coughs> utilizing the neighborhood, which is 40% white, 60% non-white, where you engage and enlist a, a group of underrepresented populations that otherwise would never get into the STEM flow, let alone demand engineering and multimedia and IT um, and sustainability related professions. And that's a strategy that's not an accident. And, um, you know, but to your point, you're talking to a college president who has a, a great record of 22% diverse hires since his arrival. Me thinking that's very poor. My team thinking, how did we ever get there to get that many underrepresented populations? And our existing faculty is predominantly, if not exclusively, white. So the, the, the um, audience is on top of one of our greatest challenges that's got to hurry up and happen tomorrow, and that is a pipeline for our own personal and professional development to get represented in the classroom, at the front of the computer, online, at the front of the classroom, in lecture. Uh, great question. Um, one of the roles that the governor has really enjoyed, and he knew it was there but didn't realize how powerful it was until he got here, was his ability to shine the spotlight, to, to try to inspire so he's gone up to the uh, folks who are building the first school portable that is a living building, completely self-integrated. <laughs> and he celebrated Stacy's good work. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> we should talk more often. We should. Um, he's gone up to Clover Park Technical College and celebrated with the students who built their own uh, energy neutral home. He's, he's gone up to the Shoreline Community College and looked at the Modern Auto Training Center and the solar building facility up there, he rolled out his executive order up there because he wanted to send that message, not just to the public, so the public could see it, but so the students could be inspired. When the University of Washington students decided they were going to figure out how to finance and put a solar panel on their own dorm, he went up and celebrated with them. Because they not only did it, they not only secured the financing for doing it, they wrote a how-to guide and have posted it online for any other college campus or kids who want to do this as well. Because he sees them as much more enlightened <laughs> and a lot of the folks he has to deal with convincing them that there's something worth paying attention here. Then on the flip side of the question, uh, when the governor created his climate task force in April, 
we talked to him about who we needed to have there in terms of voices and advice, so he got the full picture. So he's got traditional businesses, he's got progressive businesses, he's got environmental folks, he has public health officials there, but he also has the State Labor Council, executive director, uh, representative who's interested in the just transition to clean energy, and they we're focusing in on that. He's got the building trades representative looking at uh, the construction opportunities and energy efficiency. We've got the steel workers on there who've been supporting clean fuels structure, uh, infrastructure building. We've got SEIU on there looking after elderly and, and low income interests. One America on there and others to try, to try to look at the broader social justice question of how do we do this in a way that actually works for Washington. And where there are disproportionate impacts, and that can be low income and small businesses or even large industries that are energy intense but export exposed competitively, we have to address that. And that's not new to the governor. He's been doing it for years in Congress. And the flip side of that is, if we do it well, it shouldn't be just a no net gain. It actually should be an improvement across the board if we design it right and if we act soon. Can I comment on it being the, the non-male 30-something on the panel? <laughs> um, so I want to give Skanska and McKinstry this easy because these are the companies I know. but. Um, if you go to McKinster on any given day, you've got this level of leadership. They actually have a, a system where they put, I think mostly 20, 30 somethings out at school districts to teach kids about what McKinster is doing, what sustainability means. So letting young, young employees be mentors to, to the kids. Um, and I've seen that program, I've been a part of that. So I think what you're seeing up here is the leadership that took the step before. It was cool or easy. And now there's a group of us that understand that it's the right thing to do, and we're excited about it, and we have leaders that are letting us do that. And Skanska is the same way that um, one of the vice presidents was asked who should be on the panel for Skanska, and he said, Stacy, you know this stuff, we're going to send you. He could have been sitting up here, but he wanted the voice, my voice to be here, and I appreciate that. But I think you're seeing guys that signed on before it was easy or, or known, and, and they're supporting those now like myself, so accolades. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm 61, and I'm the old, you know, when I came to McKinstry, yeah, 61, you're hitting mid-stride in construction. You got 10 more years to work, and the management team are all a bunch of old crony. I am the oldest by two years of anyone on any management role in the industry right now. And we, you know, one of the reasons I'm here and they're not, they're working. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> um, we also did, we also have done a couple things. We can't survive without diversity in young people. Young people are very drawn to our website, not for how cool it is, but for a clean technology sustainability and wanting to get on the climate change issue. So I would say 70% of the, of, the of the young people around the world that contact us are contacting us because they think we're hip and they think there's a, there's a solution there for what they believe in. But uh, we've gotten better. We, we don't have the data. We've gotten a lot better uh, in the last five years because of that. So like the, the Western Bill I was talking about had an, in, uh, three non-traditional mechanical licensed professional engineers. A woman from Nigeria, a woman from Bangalore, and a white woman that was one of our lead engineers. All three of them were on that project. And uh, so I, I, I look at it, the, the question is good, but I think we can't survive without it. I think, if you walk around the history now, the average age has got to be getting close to 30. Well, under, underlying the question, which is an excellent question, by the way, is the reality of Washington's population. In fact, the population for us as a nation, uh, we have uh, an aging baby boom population. I know this is true for energy, it's manufacturing and construction. Uh, the average age in energy is in the mid-50s right now. I think that's probably true for construction and manufacturing as well. Uh, we also know that the largest segment of the future workforce are going to consist of people of color, um, people that are growing in number in the Northwest, and that will continue to grow and will provide the largest source of our future labor going forward. Otherwise, we're going to have to be importing people. So how do we prepare that new population going forward? How do we make sure that diversity isn't just a good thing to do, but it's the population we have to work with? So excellent question, and I think a real challenge for us going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I, another question I want to get in here before we have to wrap this up, and this is specific to Keith. It says, I'd like to hear, Keith, more about implementation of the executive order. What can you do with this that does not require action by the legislature? Sounds like a little frustration out there with uh, the legislature and a scale of movement here. Let alone Congress. 
So the first year, the governor focused on bringing the topic of climate change back to public discourse, because it was a term you didn't say for a while. Um, it's certainly in political circles, you never said it. He didn't say it that often during his campaign, and he was, he, he was frustrated by that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so he convened this legislative work group, and we told him, you ought to sit in the back room and negotiate with these folks to see if we can come up with some compromise, because that's the Washington way, and he said, no. We're going to do every one of those work group meetings with the legislators in public. Ten public meetings, three public hearings, three milkshakes, 9,000 letters, 300 folks testified, a lot of support for action on clean energy. And sometimes he got frustrated that that group never reached agreement on what to do next. But the success of that was, are we going to talk about it here? The pulp and paper folks are talking about it. The steel folks are talking about it. The chambers are talking about it. He's not satisfied until all the PTAs are talking about it, but at least the conversation is back. So this year, it's homework. And the homework we're going to do is how do you do what your own challenge us to do in terms of letting the market innovate and find solutions in terms of a carbon approach to the market? How do you deal with the fact that there's cleaner alternatives other than coal and having to buy it from Montana? And can't we sort of get on to our own energy sources? What are we going to do about electric vehicles and creating increased opportunity for uh, middle income folks to be able to afford one of those and know that they can plug and drive without worrying about where they're going? How are we going to clean up our fuels? And so his list was largely around, I want formal proposals on each one of these tools because I think we're going to need them all to get the job done. 90% of those will have to go to the legislature. So on a lot of them, we're saying to the agencies, don't call us because this is not a matter of governor politics and fight. Go develop some good proposals that make sense to labor, that make sense to industry, that make sense to the, to, the, to the advocates who are trying to get this done and bring an agreement to the legislature that they can go, hey, that's energy efficiency, that saves money, that's transportation, that saves money. We're going to do this. We're going to make these investments because they make sense to do. There's going to be a few things such as the carpet market legislation that are going to be politically controversial and he's going to spend capital to say, I need us to do this. And there's going to be a large campaign around whether the legislature will go along or not. And he's going to ask them point blank with the advice of this task force to, take, to do the right thing for Washington because he believes we can do it without harming our economy, without lowering our quality of life. And until, nations, until states like ours show that, the rest of the countries aren't going to be, have the nerve to do it. We have to sort of prove that it's possible. And we're one of probably 60 or 70 subnational governments that is going through proof of concept. There's almost 60 carbon markets out there already, including several provinces in China, I might add. Um, and we're going to go to Paris and say to the international community, it's time for you to step up to this. Because by the way, we're doing it, and we're getting it done. So there is. Uh, on, on clean fuels, the governor does have executive authority to say, let's start reducing the carbon intensity of our fuels. There's a campaign out there that says Inslee's going to raise your gas tax by a buck twenty. Or some legislators get excited and go, now it's up to two bucks. Nothing could be further from the truth. The last time we did the economics, it was minus three cents on diesel and plus two cents on gas. I'm not even sure that's an acceptable number. But we're not taking any of those numbers to heart. We're doing our own analysis. The oil industry, Association of Businesses, and the truckers are watching us do that analysis. They're meeting monthly with the governor to make sure it's done right. The biodiesel advocates are in the room looking at it too. Come this fall, we'll have a proposal and we'll have a debate about whether a clean fuel standard makes sense for Washington. So for those of you outside of Olympia, what do you think about that? What do you think as the challenge here, the opportunity? I, Ron, you almost smirked there. Do you have a thought on this? I've been told I'm in Pierce County, so I'm not outside of Olympia. <laughs> you know, we think about that whole sphere as one. Um, there are many challenges, but I want to, you know, I know we're getting to a close, and I'll just sneak these words in. The opportunity is leadership. The opportunity is to pull up above the data and the things we've talked about today and ask ourselves, What are you doing when you go back home? What are you doing when you go back to your employer, your institution? How are you going to engage, not in the accounting of sustainability, 
but the leading of the agenda. What presence are you going to create? What impression are you making? Here's my ode. I got a nine-year-old who doesn't even know what sustainability is. She and I are going to, in a two-hour trip to Portland Friday afternoon, talk about that big word and give it some context. I'm going to do what you suggested. You, you help me understand that's a worthy investment. It's downstream, but it's a worthy investment. What's your role in leading this agenda? My, okay. Yeah, yeah. My, my, whether you take a position on a dollar, I thought 10 years ago the federal government should have put a buck on a gallon because gasoline is so damn elastic. Last, they had, last time it was up to five bucks, it didn't even change its driving habits. And I'm work company with 500 company trucks, right? So I should have not want it. Um, I, I think the real answer is that we got to, and you already kind of didn't really say this, but we need compromise and trust. We, we, we have to do something. Americans are awfully used to abundance and convenience and cheap. And not it's food, clothing, going to a movie, everything. So we've, we've got to work together. We've got to sell the legislatures on, hey, look, I don't care if you want to go all the way in skinny dip, at least let's go swimming. I mean, sooner or later, you're going to have to get people to budge. But I think it's really, it, it, it really is the notion if we keep saying we, we can't do anything or we have to do a buck a gallon or five bucks a gallon is silly. I think we have to establish and sell a notion that it's, a, it's an economic proposition to be made. It's a workforce proposition to be made. And everyone in America is going to have to contribute. It's, it's that simple. It's going to cost more. We're not going to get away with it for another 50 years. David, that's a great transition to our final comments that I'd like for our, each of our panelists to provide. And, and I want to roll into that, the challenge of answering perhaps the one question, which is what are, what are the important priorities you see personally and for your organizations? Uh, and finally, any closing statement you would have to attach to that as well. David, do you want to just keep rolling? Yeah, that, 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 that was kind of it. But I'm just, I, I, just, I just think that there's a, lots of companies like our company, when, let's face it, we were a mechanical contractor doing design build, building buildings and having service fans going around fixing HVAC and plumbing, right? And what we really did is we saw that there was a problem that we were over consuming, we are using fossil fuels, our customer costs were going up, the buildings weren't being run right, and heck, we do mechanical, electrical, and plumbing and fans, so why don't we do that? That's the, the aha for McKinstry. And I think going forward is empowering small business, labor, manufacturing, working, Composite should be a 40 business thing within the next five or six years. I think we have to make sure people understand that everyone can get into, into this and has a part of it. Now, well, I'll close with one last little story. Our, our Minnesota office, we bought a software company from iTron. Our Minnesota office got the developers and developed a thing called PowerEd, which, which is a leave behind for when you do a K-12 remodel for energy efficiency. And guess what the leave behind is? Dashboards in their cafeterias or common areas that say kilowatts per hour, water per, per student, BTUs. They put them in all the schools, and the kids compete with the other schools. And last year, my brother got a call from the superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools who said, geez, these kids are driving our maintenance people crazy. <laughs> Turn it down, we'll wear a coat. Turn it up, we'll take our... They, 10 to 12% more savings after a 25% savings on behavior. Larry, closing thoughts, comments? Yeah. Um, one of the things that occurred to me uh, during Joram's uh, uh, excellent presentation, he was talking about his shirt being made of 80% cotton and 20% irony. Um, and then you saw the pictures of, of the uh, air pollution, which is you know a byproduct or ancillary to the uh, to the carbon uh, issue, uh, climate change. You know when we when we go out to buy things, you know people that I represent build things and make things. Let's let's think about um, let's think about that supply chain and how long it is and how we want to react to that. Uh, you know, I would say this, that to the extent that we can shorten those supply chains, buy local, uh, we're going to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, 
make sure that uh, our kids uh, are, are getting an education so that they'll be prepared to earn a living uh, here at home uh, and contribute to the improvement, improvement of the uh, climate situation uh, by adapting leading edge technologies, manufacturing, uh, construction, maintenance, uh, and uh, let's make sure we've got everybody on board. Thank you. Oh, what? Ron is passing the baton, but not giving me his extra minutes, I hope. Um, two thoughts. One, uh, China. As they uh, try to get basic electricity to their rural areas and as they try to modernize their city, their emissions are growing the largest in the world. On a per capita basis, last time I looked, they ranked 55 among the countries, among the world. The US on a per capita basis, we're ranked 12th, twice the emissions per capita compared to China. Well, you know, standard of living, et cetera. Um, governor's view on this is China's emissions don't excuse ours. They've already decided to get off coal because of the air pollution problem. There are more solar power dis uh, panels. Dis they're going on their rural areas. It's cheaper to put solar out there than it is to try to run wires to all those places. So they're way ahead of us on solar. Uh, and they have more carbon markets than, uh, than many parts of the world, and we have none yet uh, at, the, at the level at which they're doing it. So I think we have a lot to learn. We're actually hoping that the Chinese governors and the US governors can sit down here later this year and craft some agreement to push our countries respectively forward. So that's the China side of this. Um, and the story I wanted to leave you with is a current legislator, who I won't name Republican, who came to me and he's an accountant, of all things. And he said, I sat down, looked at what we were spending on our cars, and I looked at the electric vehicles and I decided I could save a bunch of money. So I went out and bought one. Just don't tell anybody. So he said, I'm not a tree hugger. In fact, I hate tree huggers, but I'm a greedy son of a bitch. So he goes, that's then, I'm sorry for the quote. Um, but what I want to do is I want to now move it to the level of where uh, I give businesses a tax break for creating a you know, charging infrastructure. I reduce their B&O tax. And so he's looking at trying to take it, take personal action, which is economic, it makes sense to him, and he can run the numbers, and turn it into political action. So I think the trick there is, for at least for the right policy framework, is to get people to take some ownership around raising their voice. This is worth doing. Uh, there's something in it for my kids. There's probably something in it for me. Uh, we can do this in a way that we don't have to be afraid, but show that we've succeeded before and we can succeed again. So I'm very hopeful that we can do it here, and I'm hopeful that other governors and the White House, and eventually we're going to go to Peru at the end of the year, and then we're going to go to Paris next year and try again to get an international agreement around this. Great. Thank you, Keith. Stacy. So I think... Uh the, my biggest challenge is I'm still answering the eight-year-old me where I'm trying to build buildings and not cut down trees, and that'll be my continual challenge till I'm 90 or over old I live to be. Um, but I think the closest I've gotten to do that is through the Berkeley School Living Building Project, where we built a living building project for our K-5 school. Uh, at the end of that project, they were doing things. We had them monitor everything, and they were doing things like turning down their, in, their, uh, their heating four degrees and wearing sweaters for a week to see how much energy they were saving. Um, told us when we weren't meeting our net zero goals. They called me at my architecture firm at the time and said, Stacy, something's wrong, you've got to come fix it. Um, but at the end, this one fifth grader asked me why all buildings aren't living. Um, and so my personal challenge is to get all kids to ask that question through the work I do with my nonprofit and also with the larger platform of Skanska, giving us the ability to build large scale buildings that are trying to achieve those goals. Great. Thank you, Stacy. Ron, you want to back clean up? I, I think I said my piece. I want to thank you for inviting me to serve on this panel. I didn't really have a, a vision for my own role. And uh, I just think you got pretty tall cotton out here. Um, what a great opportunity for us to do something, even if it appears wrong. Let's do it. Great. Well, I think you've heard today some inspiring ideas, some comments, reasons to be hopeful, reasons to want to contribute yourselves to providing solutions for sustainability for the state of Washington. Um, I'm hoping that our panelists will be willing to stay around because I know that we need to move on. We've got a lunch waiting for us. Uh, and I know that at least a couple of our panelists will be on some of the breakout panels this afternoon. So uh, on behalf of the Centers of Excellence and Centralia College, I want to thank you for coming to this session. And please join me in thanking our panelists today.
See, I told you.